Father God, I thank you for your people as we've gathered here today, Lord, to worship you in truth and spirit. I ask that you would attend to our time with your spirit, Father, that you would help me in all regards, Father, and that I would be a servant of Jesus Christ and a steward of your mysteries, and in that being found faithful by the empowering of your Holy Spirit through your word delivered to us, Lord, through the the faith once for all delivered to the saints. May we understand Jude's position here, Father, this morning. Open up our understanding, Lord, to this preamble that is before us, before the book of Revelation, to see where we're at right now currently. So, Father, I just ask for insight and ability uh, for your people and for myself. Lord, as we look to Jude, Lord, something that has a long time uh, not been presented uh, too often. And so I just ask, Father, that you would help us, Lord, as you guide us through your spirit through this. Lord, that you would attend to our time. You would send your spirit to fill your people and to fill my tongue. And right now, Father, if you would please forgive us our sin. Lord, we know that you're the one who's transferred us out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved Son in whom we have forgiveness. We have the redemption that is the forgiveness of our sins. Help us, Father, to focus upon that, the greatness of the gospel, the greatness of the battle that is here for us, Father, that we can have every confidence in it, knowing that we are blessed in you, blessed in your Son, and held and kept for him. So, Father, it's by your power that all things will come to, come to fruition. So we ask, Father, for your blessing upon our time. Please, go before us in this. Go before us with the power of your Spirit, with your word, and present us, Lord, your truths today. Father, I ask your blessing for your glory and our good. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the book of Jude, something that is not often preached from the pulpit. So you're probably asking yourself, why the book of Jude? If you remember back when we finished up the gospel of Matthew, he was addressing the church. He was giving the church the great commission. And so we said, what is the epistle that would help us to understand what the church is? Who is the church and what are they called to do? So we went through the book of Ephesians to see that that was our ecclesiology. That was the study of the called out ones, that we are the called out ones. So we looked at the book of Ephesians. And last week, um, Mark helped us to understand who is this one? Who is the overcomer? Who is the one that we look to? We look to Christ in all things. He is the one who has overcome all things. And we looked at what it means to pursue that, to pursue holiness. And there's a lack of that in the church. And so we said, what do we need to be doing? How do we need to be doing that? So uh, Mark encouraged us in those regards to, to fix and focus our intents upon him. Understanding that dead fish don't do anything, right? He used that as an illustration. Dead fish don't do anything. What are we doing, though, as a fish that are alive? As alive, what are we doing? Are we moving and are we sanctifying ourselves? Are we thinking about how we participate in God's beautiful plan to cleanse the bride, the church, and to present her? And so as we look at the book of Jude, as we finished up Ephesians, we looked at the fact that he gives us battle armor. And we talked about this. We are a church that is not on a cruise liner, but on a battleship, okay? We're on a battleship. And Jude is saying to us in this morning is he wants us to understand that there is a battle within the church. 20, see, it's almost been 30 years ago I heard the first sermon about the battle being within the church, 30 years ago, I heard that from a young pastor. He said, the battle is not outside the church. The battle isn't outside. It's inside the church. We need to be on our guard. We need to be prepared for apostates in the church. And so this morning, I would like to open us with that understanding is that we need to look at this. And I've been asked many questions. Are we in the final times? Has anybody else been asked this question? Hey, are we in the final times? No. We're sure getting close though. A lot of preparation going on out there. A lot of things happening in the world right now that we need to be aware of. But are these the last times? No, I think we're in the book of Jude. The book of Jude is like this in between uh, the, the, the epistles of John and then before he writes the Revelation, it comes right in between those in the canon of Scripture. But it also comes right after Second Peter. If you read Second Peter, it's a good preparation for the book of Jude. If you've read the book of Jude and you're like, what is he talking about? I'll do you a favor. Scripture teaches Scripture. Read the second epistle of Peter first, especially chapter two and three, will help you to understand that Jude is coming in right after him. Peter is speaking of things in the future. All of the apostles, John speaks of things in the future. The gospel writers think of things in the future, things apostate. When they mention apostates, when they mention these things that will come within the church, they're speaking of the future. Jude is speaking of present. He's saying, oh, by the way, Peter, that was good. Now I'm writing right after that, probably a year or maybe two years, just after 2 Peter has is, is, is been written by Peter, Jude comes out and says, guess what? It's right now. So when you start thinking about Revelation and you start thinking about the things in the book of Revelation, we're probably at the end of chapter three and chapter four hasn't started yet. How many of you know what I'm talking about? We're right up to that point, okay? We haven't yet started what he saw in the heavens. We haven't yet been raptured off of this earth. So my eschatology says in between Revelation 3 and 4, there's something going to happen. 
and we're not there yet. When he goes up, I think there's a, revel, there's a rapture happening right about there. Now I've just played my cards on. That's eschatology for the day. We're not going there anymore. We're done with that. We're moving on, okay? We just don't have the time to do the book of Revelation, but that's where it would fit. But Jude is writing to this audience. We don't know who the audience is. He's writing to this audience and he's not trying to correct doctrinal errors. He's saying, watch out for these individuals. This is what they look like. This is how they do things. This is how they sneak in like little lawyers and they try to look all good, but then you see in the conduct of their life, there's something missing. So Jude is gonna present to us these apostates. He's gonna present it to us in such a way that we just look at their lives and what they're doing. What, what, is, what is going on in their lives? Like a little sneaky lawyer. Sorry, if there's a lawyer in the room, I do apologize now. It's just a caricature, okay? But Jude, who's Jude? Let's just start with the first word, Jude. Who's this guy? In the Greek, it's Judas. It's kind of ironic, too, if you think about this. Who is the, the, the leading apostate in the church? Judas Iscariot. He was the chief apostate. He was the one that turned against the gospel. He was the one that turned about against the living word of God is Judas. Judas Iscariot. There's many other Judes in Scripture. I mean, there's many other Judases in Scripture. But here we use the word, the, the, the understanding of Jude rather than the Greek rendering Judas or the Hebrew rendering of the, of the name would be Judah. So you've got a man who's got a wonderful Old Testament name and not such a good New Testament name, Jude. Who is this? He's a bondservant. Now, this is Jude. This particular Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. We say half-brother because he had the same parents, earthly parents, but not the heavenly parent of the father, right? So we see he's a half-brother. But Jude, look at the way he introduces himself, a bondservant of Jesus. He doesn't say, oh, by the way, I grew up with this guy. He doesn't say, I got credentials, this is my brother. He says, I'm a bondservant. I'm a slave. Something has changed in Judas, Jude's life. Something has drastically changed. If you look at the gospel of John, starting in, verse five, in chapter 7, verse 5, his brothers grew up with him and they said, you're not the Messiah. These guys grew up with him and said, hey, if you're the Messiah, and they're mocking him, go to the festival. And he waited and went later. So if you read in, in the gospel of John, starting in verse 5, the brothers, Jesus' brothers, they didn't believe who he was. They grew up with him. And again, it's very ironic that this name is that one in the the group of of those who are there. But Jude, a bondservant. So something has changed for Jude. Something has drastically changed for this half-brother of Jesus, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. That James was the one who's at the Jerusalem Council who wrote the epistle of James. This is one of Jesus's other brothers. James and Judas and uh, Simon, the the brothers of Jesus. And these are two brothers. He identifies himself this way. He's not an apostle. In verse 17, he'll mention the fact that he's not an apostle. He just keeps lowering himself and lowering himself and saying, I am a humble servant. I'm I'm a doulos of God. I am one who has been commissioned, so my life has changed. Not, I'm not a brother of Christ, but I am his now, his servant. My life has been changed. I am a humble servant of the Lord. So understand that. He could have said many other things here. He could have put himself up. He could have said, I have credentials. He doesn't do it. He does not do that. He humbles himself in this because he has something to present to the church. He's very pastoral too, by the way. He wants the church to know something. He wants the church to be led. He wants the church to understand what's going on. He's like Charles Spurgeon. I have a quote from Charles Spurgeon this morning. Charles Spurgeon said, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. Wow, Now, how many of you would say, I think you're off, Charles. Charles Spurgeon, he says, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. Like, I first read that and I went, no, that is discernment to know the difference between right and wrong. But he clarifies, he says this, it is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Between right and almost right. That's the field of Satan. That's where Satan likes to play. That's why Satan likes to use uh, apostates in the church. That's how he gets in. It looks almost right. Like there's just something missing. I don't know how many people have come to me and say, you know, they say this, but it's just something's not quite right. I'm saying that's the Holy Spirit inside you telling you there's something off. And if it's off a little bit, it's not God's. God's word is perfect. God's word is there. The faith that we have given, given is perfect and holy without error in every aspect, whether you understand the original manuscripts or not. But I like Charles Persian. He says, it's knowing the difference between right and almost right. Without a question, the greatest threat to the church has always been false teaching. It's subtly and severity make it a spiritual poison unlike any other. John MacArthur. John MacArthur is right. 
It's those subtle things that sneak into the church. It's the subtle things that we don't recognize. It's the subtle things that kind of get underneath the radar and we don't recognize them until fruit pops up. It results in damage far greater than the cause of any external assault. The casualties are spiritual and consequences are eternal. It's true. Very, very true. The eternal consequences. And this isn't something that's foreign to Jesus. Jesus taught us this clearly. Matthew 7 is a good chapter to look at for understanding fruit, righteous fruit, and unrighteous fruit. To see that there will be ones who come to Jesus at the end and they'll say, Lord, Lord. He'll say, I knew you not. And they'll have these supernatural gifts. They'll have these wonderful things that they think were prominent to present before him. He'll say, I knew you not. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. But let me read to you from Matthew 7. If you want to turn there, turn to Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. I'm going to read this to you this morning just to say, how did Jesus address false prophets in the church that they would come? He said, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Now we use that character all the time, don't we? We take sheep and we put it on a wolf and we say, oh, that's what he's talking about. We use that character all the time. But hear what he says. But inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits, what comes out of their life. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. This is in conjunction with what Jude is saying to us this morning. He's going to tell us about these individuals and how they present themselves. Turn with me to Acts 20. This is one that always plagues my heart and mind a lot of the times. And just the fact that I need to be aware of what Paul tells the Ephesian elders. He's meeting in Miletus. He went past Ephesus in chapter 20. If you look down to starting in verse 25, but just what he's doing here. Paul had traveled past Ephesus because he didn't want to get delayed there. He lands in Miletus and he meets with the Ephesian elders. One church, a multiplicity of leaders. So we see that in this, we understand that there's supposed to be a plurality of leaders in the church. But much of what I'm going to read to you this morning should hit hard upon us with the greatness of the glory of Christ, but with also a stern warning to us in regards to who the elders are amongst us, who we appoint. It says, and now in verse 25 of chapter 20 of Acts, we read this. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his very own blood. Notice two things there as I stop for verse 28. Who did this? The Holy Spirit appoints the overseers. And who is the one who's paid for it? The shepherd of the church. Christ has purchased the church with his very own blood. Verse 29, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, or from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert. I want to stop there real quick. What did Paul tell us in in Ephesians? Do you guys remember back in Ephesians? He says, be on the alert, therefore pray. Paul told us in Ephesians, be on the alert, be in prayer, be aware of these things, be discerning. Know the difference between right and almost right. Be discerning, be on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. He's talking to the elders. He's talking to the church. He's warning them to be careful. He's saying in the future, these things are going to happen. In the future, there are going to be false men who come in and be on your guard against those. Be on the alert. So back to Jude. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, the beloved, in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Doesn't that just sound beautiful to you? Doesn't that ring good, good in your ears? Do you notice there's something missing there? Most every epistle in the New Testament starts out with grace and peace. He doesn't say grace here. He's talking about a gracious Lord, though. In the implication of this introduction, he's talking about God being very gracious to us, but he doesn't mention that. Look what he mentions, and this is the only epistle that we have that says this. He says, may mercy 
and peace and love be multiplied to you. Sounds like 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, he says, grace and peace be to yours in fullest measure. He says, in fullest measure, may God's grace and peace come to you. I like Jude. Jude's very pastoral. Jude wants you to have the fullness. He wants you to have a fullness of this because you're called in God the Father. You're kept and may grace, and may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Again, this is a preamble. This is an introduction to what is coming in the, in the future as well in the calling back up. But he's saying presently, these are the things that are yours. These are the things that you need to recognize. These are the things that are yours in Christ. Called. So you're called into this. Let's talk about that for a second. Back up. It says to those who are called. Who are the called? Who are those who he's referring to? We don't know the specific audience, the specific congregation that Jude is writing to, but he knows that we know that they are the called, called and the beloved in God the Father and the kept ones. So let's look at those three things this morning. These are your three points. We are called. In Ephesians 1, 4, 5, and 6, we see that this calling came before the foundations of the world. That you were called, that you were summoned to God. This is the elect. These are those who before the foundations of the world were drawn out, who were, who were appointed to be summoned by the king. The word called there means to be summoned. How many of you are gonna not be, go, to, go to God when he summons you? He summons us. He calls us. An effectual calling. So join the battle. There's no reason to fear. You're the called ones. You're the ones who have faith in Jesus Christ. You are the ones who have the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within you to go to battle. How many of you are fearful of the battle right now? I just read to you a little, I just mentioned everyone in Afghanistan. Isn't it good to know that there's Christians in Afghanistan who know that God has put them there and they're okay with staying there? Even though the Taliban is going from door to door to door trying to find these individuals. To whatever extent, I don't know the specifics. All I know is that some of them are saying, this is where God has us. We're in the battle. We're in the battle for the gospel. Not in the battle for this land mass. We're in the battle. We're the called. We're called to do this. We're called by a sovereign God to be right here. You're called by God right now to be here. Now, there's not somebody knocking on your door, walking from door to door, but you're called right now for the battle here, for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. You're called here in this time, in this place, to do battle, to hold up the word of God, to be a bondservant of Jesus Christ, to be a slave, a doulos, to be one who works for him. You're owned. You're owned by him. Selfless submission to, to him in that, in that calling. So you're the called ones. It can be translated as to call or an eminent, uh, uh, it's a passive participle, but it's that he has set apart and chosen them as his children. Why do we sing so many songs about children this morning? He has chosen you to be his children. You're the loved ones. You're the beloved, but you're called out of darkness. You've been called out of darkness, out of an authority of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, into Christ, where you have redemption, the forgiveness of your sins, Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Doesn't that sound good in your ears? That God has paid for you. You've been redeemed. You've been called by name. You belong to who? God. You belong to Christ. That's who you are. You're called out of this. Once dead sinners to embrace the gospel of faith. Remember back in Ephesians chapter two, verses one through 10, we saw the gospel of grace there. It's almost like Jude has read Ephesians too. And he knows what the church is supposed to be like. He knows what the church's characteristics are and how they're supposed to be play out in your day-to-day -day life. It's as though Jude is making mention of these things. A very short epistle, 25 verses, but he concentrates many things that would have been known by the Christians by the church, mostly Jews, I, I believe too, by the content of what we see in the book of Jude, he's probably talking to Jewish Christians, but he's addressing them as the elect. Much like he would have talked to uh, Timothy. In 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9, we read this. Therefore, so this is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He says this to Timothy. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, because you are called out to do that. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, from all eternity past into all eternity future. We are called to do that. We're the called out ones. Do you want to get in the war? 
Is that enough right now to get you to call, call it out? Is that enough to say, put on your battle armor and go? Some of you are probably thinking, well, that's pretty close. Well, thankfully, Jude doesn't just leave us with called. He moves on to beloved as well. Being loved. So you're not only the called out ones, you're also being loved of the children of God. Who's your father? Your father is in heaven. God the Father. Don't you pray that way? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. How holy be your name. I can address God as my Father. That never really hit me to an exalting Christ conference where they said, write down what you think of God. How do you refer to God? And I just went, almighty God, you know, maker of heaven and earth, right? Somebody was sitting right next to me and says, my Father. And I was just blown away. I'm looking, I'm looking at all the attributes of God. As, he's almighty, he's this, he's this, he's this. Young lady sitting right next to me, not my wife, but it's okay. I knew her husband sitting right there. She says, he's my father. That was it. I just went, she got an A. I got a B. She had the right answer. I was like focusing upon God's almighty power, which is good. But she's like, no, he's my father. I'm one of the beloved. Beloved, translated this way, being loved. Not just beloved as in that's who you are, but action, being loved. You're being loved by God the Father right now. You're in his love. A love which he has for his son. You have the same love with which he loves his son. Can you fathom that for a second? The same love that he expresses towards his son. Now this is a, something I don't believe on the, the, the church fathers, but so hold on for a second. I'm about to say something that I don't believe just to express to you what that love is like. Some people, people believe that the love between the father and the son is so intense that the Holy Spirit emanates from that. I don't believe that. I just want to say, that's the intensity that these church fathers, I believe it was Augustine, believed that there was such an immense love between the father and the son that the Holy Spirit emanates from that. Think about that for a minute. I don't believe that, but that's how intense they saw the love of the father and the son for each other. And you enter into that. I just want to use that as an illustration of that's how intense that love is. You're beloved. You're being loved by God. He told the Romans, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You're enemies of God, yet Christ dies for you. You were opposed to God, you hated God, and he died for you. Before you knew God, he paid for your sins. Before the foundations of the world, the lamb which was slain was already there. Revelation 13, 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. While we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. The apostle John wrote this about God's love for believers, seeing how great a love, quote, seeing how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God and such we are. First John 3, 1. God chose to love the elect sinners even when they were defiant sinners. That's an immense love. While you were someone's enemy, you were God's enemy. He dies for you. Let me read to you also John 17. This is the high priestly prayer. John 17, verses 22 through 26. Let me read this for you this morning. The glory which we have which you have given me, this is Jesus talking to the Father, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. Whoa, wait a minute. They're one, but we get to enter into that. I in them and you in me. Christ in us and God the Father in his Son. That they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me. And loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them and will make it known so, so that the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Which is greater, Christ being in you or the love of Christ being in you? Well, here he gives you both. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to make a delineation. Christ in you 
and the love of Christ in you and the love of the Father in you. Remember we talked about this before in Romans 8 where we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit dwelling within us because the Spirit of there is there, the Spirit of Christ is there, and the Spirit of the Father is there. So we have the Trinity in there, but now we have the love which is emanating between them in us. Christ is not just leaving us with the person, he's leaving us with the affection. He's saying in the high priestly prayer, you have the affection which with, with which God loves me in you. Is that enough? Is that enough for you this morning to go to war? Being called, being loved? Is that enough? Is that enough? You say, yeah, yeah. The first one was enough. Second one, okay, you doubled up, you doubled down. Jude says, no, I also want to give you one more. You're the called, your beloved, being loved in God the Father. So you're in God the Father. His love is being given to you as a father and kept for Jesus. Some of you might say kept by Jesus. Either one is fine. Kept by Jesus or kept for him. Both are true. You're being kept for Jesus as the bride of Christ, but you're also being kept by him, by him. So now is that enough? Is that enough for us to think about? Being kept by him. To observe, this is what the word means. To observe, pay attention, pay attention to or keep under guard. To maintain. How many of you do maintenance on your vehicles? You do preventative maintenance on your vehicle. Uh, Hopefully you all do preventative maintenance on your vehicles, right? You get your oil changed every 5,000 miles, you rotate your tires. Everybody should be shaking their head, right? You get your brakes checked, right? Okay, I'm not driving around any of you people, okay? What do you do to make sure things are in order? Do you paint your house every five years so that it doesn't rot? Everybody should be shaking their head, yes, right? Uh, maintenance. Gentlemen, you buy your wife flowers when it's not her birthday. Ma- yes, yes. All the men should be, it's preventative maintenance. Some guys are going, no, don't say this. You're getting into my wheelhouse. Don't do that, pastor. Now you're meddling. You're not preaching, right? What does it mean to be kept? What does it mean to be kept by Christ? Kept for him and kept by him. Being maintained. He's observant of you. He watches over you. He pays attention to you. He keeps you under guard. He observes your day-to-day activities. He's there with you all the time, maintaining you, keeping you in balance. But you better be participating with that. How many of you have your car and it just goes to the shop and does its own thing? How many of you, any of those things I just mentioned? You have to put effort into those things to get them to happen kept by Christ, kept for him, but we pursue him. And how is it that he maintains us? Let's see what he says in John 10, verses 27 and 28, which is our last song today. We'll read in accordance with this particular verse. John 10, verses 27 and 28, we read this. My my sheep hear my voice. You hear his word, and you know it's his word. When somebody teaches you falsely, the reason why you can see that it's almost not right is because the Spirit of God is within you saying, there's just something not right with what I just heard. And if you feel that today, would you please email me? If you feel something I've said today is not quite right, you need to ask me and say, that just doesn't sound quite right. Let's talk. It says, my sheep hear my voice. This is John 10, 27 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. You know, I've met people who think think they can jump out of Jesus' hand. I read this, and I go, whose hands are you in? Earlier today, when we were practicing music, someone said, they must be in the Allstate man's hands. I'm like, I hope not, because if you're in the hands of Christ, he is one with the Father, Almighty God has you in his hands. You think you can jump out of his hands? You are in the wrong hands. There's no way you're in the hands of Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, and his son whom he gave for our sins. There is no way if you think you can jump out of those hands. You might want to consider the fact that you might not be saved and never have been and repent and come to Christ would be the presentation of the gospel right there. If you think you can jump out of those hands, you're in the wrong hands. Because he says it right there. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one. What does he mean by no one? No one. That includes yourself. You got to remember that. When he says no one, he means you too. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hands. Father's hand. Okay, so not only are you in the hands of Christ, you're also in the hands of God the Father. So if Christ is not enough, which he is, the Father is included too. 
Jesus Christ has promised to keep believers secure for all of eternity. All of eternity. So what Jude is doing here is he's taking away all of our fear. Jude is removing fear. He's removing worry and anxiety. He's saying, you are these people. This is who I'm addressing. You are the called. You are the ones who are being loved by the Father and you're kept for Jesus Christ. This is who you are. This is who I'm addressing. Not a singular congregation, but you people here who have faith in Christ are the ones he's addressing. He wants you to know that there's a battle. So he says, mercy and peace and love. This threefold expression occurs only here in the New Testament. He wants you to have mercy and peace and love. He talks about a gracious God, but he wants you to understand these are the things, this mercy. God removes his wrath. You have peace. You need not worry about anything in the world. And he's loving you every day. He is watching over you, maintaining you. He's giving you this in fullest measure. You're being filled with this constantly. Paul spoke of this in Romans 9.23. Paul told the Romans that God has manifested the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Think about this. Every day, you're like a bull or glass being filled with God's mercy. We understand what, what we see in Lamentations where God's mercies are new every morning. You are that. You are something. You're a vessel. Paul told us in Romans 9.23 that we are vessels of God's mercy. Every day he's pouring mercy into you. He's removing the wrath that we rightly deserve for our sins every single day if we're faithful to confess them. Mercy. We're being filled with his mercy every single day. What about this peace? What did Jesus say about peace? What did Jesus say when he, before he left? What did he say about peace? He walked in the room, he says, peace be with you. Why could he say that? He is the peace. But he also said, he said this to us, to his disciples in, 14, in John 14, 27, he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you. So we don't look for the peace in this world. We do not look for peace in this world. There's gonna be trials and tribulations in this world. There's gonna be war all over the place. We don't look for that kind of peace. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Anybody fearful today? I'm meeting people that are still fearful of things. I'm like, who are you trusting in? What are you trusting in? To be fearful is not to take this to heart, to not understand that Christ has given us his peace. He leaves it with us. He didn't say, my peace is here and now it's gone. He says, I leave with you my peace. You're mine. I watch over you. I'm maintaining you. You're the called. You're the beloved. I'm keeping you. I'm maintaining you. This is the peace he's talking about. And we already covered the love. Clearly, God pours out his abundant blessings on those whom he calls, loves, and keeps. That's the blessing. His love is showered down upon us, revealed to us. So we're called, we're being loved, we're being kept, and we're blessed with his mercy, his peace, and the love is multiplied to us because it comes every single day, every moment that we have, we need not worry. Beloved. Now here's where he interrupts himself because he was gonna say something else. Look what it says in verse three. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about your common, our common salvation, he wanted to tell you the gospel. He wanted to tell you about the greatness of the gospel. He was ready to expound the gospel and present Christ and exalt Christ and lift him up before you. But he got interrupted by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said, no, even though that's a wonderful thing to do that, you're talking to those who are being loved. You're making every effort to do that. So he's sitting there trying to figure out what to write. I felt the necessity he felt compelled by the Holy Spirit to write us something else. Now, what would take more importance? He's saying the gospel is right out here. The gospel, I need to tell you about our common salvation, but there's something else you need to be aware of. Wouldn't that cause your attention to just go up a little bit? He wants to tell you about your salvation, but then he says, hold it. I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. Contesting earnestly agonizing. The word there is agonizing. He wants you to agonize 
for the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints. Not just faith in Christ, all of the scriptures. What he means here by faith is he's saying all the encompassment of all the scriptures that have been handed down to us. Everything that's contained within God's word given to us. This is the faith he's talking about. The summation of all these things. He wants you to do this. He wants you to think about this. I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints because of who you are, because you're the called, you're the beloved, you're the kept. God has given you his mercy and peace and love. Therefore, contend, agonize for the faith. Agonize for the word of God. Because, look at verse four. The four there could be a because. He wants you to do this because of this. There's something opposing the gospel. I could sit here, Jude would say, I could sit here and tell you all about the gospel. I could elaborate the beauty of Christ to you right now. But because of something else that is threatening that, I'm writing to you on a different theme. That should catch our attention. Because he interrupts the gospel to tell us, be aware of this. Because certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Long beforehand, they've already been written off. There's already something against them. They're already opposed to God. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Two categories that he's gonna unfold for us in the rest of this epistle. Those two categories he wants us to be fully aware of, the opposition to the gospel. He was about to tell us about the gospel. He's saying, you need to know about these people. And there's two characteristics that are present in this. They were marked out from condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of God into freedom. Freedom to do whatever they want. And they deny our Lord and Master, our, and Lord, our, mas- our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. They deny Christ in their lives. The fruit of their lives is such. That's what he's going to unpack. So verses three and four are basically what he's going to unpack throughout the epistle. And so we'll start doing that in the weeks to come. We'll do three weeks, three more weeks in Jude to see what he is warning us about. But we read the same warning in John, 2 John chapters or verses 9, 10, and 11. So in 2 John 9, 10, and 11, we read this. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, this is us, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Anyone who goes beyond scripture, anyone who's not giving to you the scriptures. I just had a discussion the other day. Somebody said, what if we find more epistles? What if somebody digs up another epistle? What if we dig up something that Paul wrote? You know, Paul wrote four letters to the Corinthians. We've got two of them. Do we need those other two? No. God delivered his word to us. This individual, this young young person wanted to know about apologetics, wanted to know about the canon of scripture. And they said, isn't there possibly more? I said, no. Revelation tells us very clear that you're not to add to or take away from this, the canon of scripture. And And even Peter says, and Peter, he says, we have all we need for life and godliness. The issue of the sufficiency of the word of God is based upon the character of God. Has he given us everything we need for life and godliness, for eternal life and to live a life that pursues him, to pursue holiness, like Mark was telling us last week? We need to pursue holiness. We need to pursue the righteousness of Christ. Has God withheld anything from you? Who is the first one to say that in all of time? Satan, in the garden. He told Adam and Eve, God's holding back from you. Go eat the tree. They believed it. Has God held anything back from us? Jude is talking about this delivering of this faith. Jude is talking about the close of scripture. Yet he hasn't seen the revelation yet. But this is the preamble to the revelation. This is basically saying, this is the time it's set. There's still a letter yet to come. There's still the close of the scripture. But he's speaking with the emphasis that all we have in scripture is what we have in front of us right now. He's writing an epistle. But he says, the faith has been delivered. What you need has been delivered. In this case, it will be delivered because John will write the last, the Apostle John. So this little interruption here, again, why does the canon of Scripture get interrupted between the epistles of John and the apocalypse of John? Because he's he's writing a preamble. We are here right now. This is where we're at right now. 
When somebody asks me where we were at in the book of Revelations, we're in the book of Jude. We're not in the book of Revelation yet. We're in the book of Jude. Read the book of Jude. They've snuck in. Apostates have snuck into the church. We're believing things that are almost true, but they're not. Be discerning. Be discerning. There's a sufficiency of all that we have in Scripture. There's a sufficiency of the gospel, and there's a sufficiency of Christ. Can you guys all say sufficiency? It's sufficient. You have everything you need. Don't let anybody tell you you don't. Why? Why do you have everything you need? Because you're called for the foundations of the world. You're beloved in God the Father, and you're kept for Christ, and you're being kept for him. He's keeping you. Are you ready to go to war? She, yeah. Those are three great things. Three great things. I'm called. I've been called out, summoned by the king. Not just summoned by the king to be a warrior, but to be what? His child. Beloved. You're being loved by God. You're being maintained. You're being observed. Is that a frightful thing? God's observing you right now. He's observing me. He knows every thought in my mind and my heart. And we're being kept. So we're being called, we've been called, we're being loved, and we're being kept. And then that blessing, we receive mercy and peace and love. And Jude says, may that be multiplied to you. Again, think of Jude as a pastor. Jude is caring for us. Jude is saying, be aware of the apostates in this world, in this time. It has come and it will continue until Christ's return. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for what we're looking at in Jude. Where are we at right now? Where is the church at today? As those who are called, who are beloved in God the Father, those who are being kept for Christ, by Christ. Father, thank you for the maintenance of your son. Thank you for the shepherd and guardian of our souls. Thank you for the one who watches over us every single day, who intercedes for us who is our parakletos, who is the representative, who is our lawyer before you. In your throne room, in the courtroom of heaven, we have Christ, our Savior, who has paid for our sins, who makes the defense for us when Satan throws things against us. Christ is standing right there, making intercession for us. Father, is there anything that we should fear? No. We have your peace. We have your mercy. So, Father, please, help us to trust in these things. Help us to trust in what Jude is presenting to us who we are in Christ, and what we need to be battling against. He is calling us to war. He is a general. He is a pastor calling us out to war. May we understand that in the weeks to come. May we understand what the war is and how we are to participate in that great fight for the faith. So please, strengthen us and equip us, Father, for doing so. May your word find deep, dark roots in our heart, Lord. May our hearts be opened to read and to understand all that you have for us. Bless your people, Father. May they be ambassadors for Christ in all aspects. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.